If you would, let's take a moment and open in our Bibles. Open our Bibles to Psalms 119. Psalms 119. It is so good to see each and every one of you with us here today for another time period of coming together to worship our Heavenly Father and to sing songs of praises unto Him. As mentioned earlier, we do have those who are visiting here with us. We want you to know that you are a welcome guest. If you hear something or say something that maybe spawns a question, please be our friend and come up to us afterwards and give us a chance to sit down and maybe answer that question and to study with you from the wonderful Word of God. Over the course of this year, we have been engaged in a series of monthly studies addressing the subject of I Can Control. And we've talked about a number of things regarding our responsibility to control within our lives. A couple of months back, we talked about how we can control our actions. And then the next lesson was we can control our reactions. This morning's lesson, though, we're going to look at the subject of our ability to control our Bible studies. God places upon us as Christians a responsibility to know His Word. As a matter of fact... You cannot know God, you cannot know about God unless you know His Word. I'm amazed sometimes at the number of, the peop number of people in the world who profess a belief in God, profess a knowledge of God, and when you sit down and talk with them, they, they've got a whole lot of different thoughts about God, but none of the thoughts actually come from the very source that gives us information about Him, and that's the Bible. I'll give you a little insight into tonight's lesson. Tonight's lesson, there's one part where we're going to talk about, use the phrase, babbler. And the passage we'll look at this evening, the word babbler is used in reference to Paul. Now here's a little, like I said, uh, uh, insight into what we'll be looking at tonight. The word babbler is translated from a Greek word, which basically means seed gatherer. And what they were accusing of the Apostle Paul, accusing him of doing, is basically saying you're someone that picks up pieces of information and throws them together and talks like you know what you're talking about when you don't. A babbler. Well, there are people in the world today who do this with the Word of God. They'll hear bits and pieces about God's Word and then they'll draw within their mindset a conclusion about God, but in reality they don't know Him, nor do they know about Him. And so when you become a Christian, when you obey the gospel's call, it was because you sat down and you studied his word, you learned about him, and you were convicted by his word enough to obey him. And therefore, if you want to continue serving God, we have to continue studying the wonderful word of God. Now, I want you to observe with me in the passage that we called in Psalms 119, beginning there in verse 33, one of the first things that we see about our controlling our Bible studies is that we have to have a desire to study His Word. Don't view the Bible as your schoolwork. With schoolwork, you sit down and you study one section for one test, and then you go on. Maybe the information may be used at the end of the year, a cumulative test, maybe not, but once you're past that, it kind of goes back into the recesses of your brain where you probably won't use it again. Or at least that's the way we approach schoolwork. But when it comes to Bible study, it's not the same thing. Your young people, your children, my children, doing their lessons for Bible class is far greater of importance than their schoolwork. Somebody says, yeah, but they're not graded for that. With their school, they are. Well, yes, they will be graded by God at some point regarding how they serve Him, how they follow Him. And so we need to make certain that there is a desire within our hearts to know more of the Word of God. Notice with me in Psalms 119, and this was a passage we used for our scripture reading earlier, beginning there in verse 33. A couple of things to observe. Notice first off, David says, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. He desired the Lord to teach him, to make certain that David knew what was right, that knew he knew what was the will of God. He says, and I shall keep it to the end. Then verse 34, he says, give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Notice that, give me understanding, and I will keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Then verse 35, he says, make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. 
Look at David's appeal unto God. Teach me, O Lord. Give me understanding. Make me walk in the path. Then verse 36. Incline my heart to your testimonies and, and not to covetousness. Lord, incline my heart to your testimonies, to your word. And then verse 37, he says, Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in my way. Notice that again. Bring it, there we go. Revive me in your way. This is what David was praying for. Praying to the Lord for help, turning to him for help. He says, establish your word in your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach which I dread for your judgments are good. He says, behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. Brethren, when we look at David, we look at someone who had a desire to know the word of the Lord. He wanted the Lord to teach him. He wanted the Lord to give him understanding. He wanted the Lord to make him walk in the paths of his word. He wanted the Lord to incline his heart to the understanding. He wanted the Lord to revive it within him, his word. He wanted the Lord to establish the word within his servant, within David. And David says, Behold, I long, I long for your precepts. Brethren, this is the attitude that we must have. This is the attitude that we must have towards Bible study. So much so that a day does not go by wherein we do not give attention to his word. Think about what, day, what the Apostle Paul in his letter to Timothy wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. He writes this not simply because Timothy was a preacher of the word of God. He writes this to Timothy because Timothy was a Christian, a child of God, one who would be called upon to give a defense for the hope that lies within him, to be able to teach and to rebuke and to exhort. Notice what he says. 1 Timothy 4, verse 13, Till I come, give attention to reading. Until I come, give attention to exhortation. Until I come, give attention to doctrine. Brethren, this is what we need to be doing. We need to have the desire to study the Word of God, but we have to give attention to it. We have to make the time. I recognize that our lives are extremely busy. I understand that things go on right and left. If you have children in school and they're active in various extracurricular activities, then you're always running here and you are running there. We get up in the morning and then finally we lay our heads down at night and we have forgotten to study. So, well, we'll just do it tomorrow. And then tomorrow is just as busy. Well, and then we'll do it the next day. You know, it's interesting. There was a time when if you missed a TV show, you missed a TV show. And if you missed it in the, the, the replay throughout the rest of the season, then you missed it, period. But then along came the VCR. We won't talk about the short little forerunner of that that died. The VCR, if you could figure out how to work the thing, you could then record your TV show. And so a lot of people then were able to do more things within their lives because now they could come back and watch their shows later. Nowadays, you can record a show and, and watch it from your tablet or wherever, depending on what you have. But the point is I've often been amazed, even within my own life, at how we make time for that. We make time to watch the shows that we have missed. We make those opportunities. But when it comes to the Word of God, which we could always carry with us, whether it's in a small binding or it's on your phone or a tablet or what have you, it seems to be difficult to make the time to study. And it must not be this way. The Word of God must, it must be so important within our lives that we are willing to give attention to reading, to exhortation, and the doctrine. So we understand that we can control our Bible studies. We can control our desire. We can have and put forth the necessary attention. But let me share with you some reasons why we should be studying the wonderful Word of God. There's two key reasons we're going to look at this morning. The first reason is very simple. There are a wealth of spiritual benefits that come when we sit down and study the Word of God. I'll give you one right now. Have you ever been studying with someone or talking with someone about religious matters 
and they ask you a question, how come y'all do this or how come you don't do that? Or what does your church have to teach about that? Or what does your doctrine have to say about that? Have you found yourself in a place and point where you're saying to yourself, I wish I could give them a good answer, but I didn't pay attention to the sermon last Sunday? Yes. We find ourselves in those situations where we just, we wish that we could give an answer. Well, this is the benefit of Bible study. Bible study gives you those answers. Over in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, the apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he tells the brethren there, he says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. When we study the Word of God, we develop a skill to use that Word. We become skilled in using the Word of God. If you were to, if you were to go into surgery, would you prefer a surgeon that was exceptionally skilled in the using of the scalpel or someone who was somewhat clumsy and unskilled in the use of the scalpel? I'd want the person who knew exactly what, where, why, and how much to cut. That's what you would want. Well, we are children of God. If we've obeyed the gospel's call, we should be skilled in the word of God. This is not to say that, that we're expecting you to know every single thing of the Bible, for we must study and study and grow. But what you do know, know well, and be able to teach it and tell it unto others, to give a defense for the hope that lies within you. Interestingly enough, I use the illustration of a scalpel. The Bible tells us that the Word of God is effectively a sword. And not a dull sword, but a sharp sword. And any time you're going to be welding a sword, you're going to be using the sharp sword, you better know what you're doing. Over in the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, in Ephesians chapter 6, note with me there if you would in verse 17. Let's start there. He says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, I understand that in principle, this is figurative. This is a figurative statement. But the Word being the sword of God, it is considered, therefore, then an offensive weapon in our battle against sin. And so, while there are times that we use defensive weapons, such as the shield, of, uh, the, the, the shield that we have there, we see within the text in the helmet of salvation and the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, that Word of God, is what we use as an offensive weapon to teach others, to use when we are challenged by sin. But we have to know how to use it. Hebrews. Notice with me, if you would, in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, the Hebrew writer talks about the Word of God in the context of when we walk astray, here's the job of the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 4, let's begin there in verse 11. We'll read down through verse 13. He says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Now note this. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. He says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him, to whom we must give an account. When we study the word, we need to be ready for the sharpness of the word. It's going to fall within our lives and reveal to us what is right and what is wrong. We need to be skilled in using the Bible. We don't use the Bible to prove some point to somebody. We use the Bible to teach someone. We don't use the Bible to create division within the world. We use the Bible to save the world. But again, it falls down hard and it is sharp. That's why some people think about Acts chapter 8. Individuals there stoned Stephen. It says they were cut to the heart when they heard the word. Whereas in Acts chapter 2, they were pricked in the heart. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? God has given us something powerful. God has given us something sharp that we must be skilled in using. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. The Apostle Paul, in writing his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy, that is, chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. He says, be diligent to present yourselves approved unto God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly 
dividing the word of truth. Some translations say rightly handling the word of truth. Again, he's not saying that every individual, that you should right now be extremely skilled and know all the answers and understandings of Ezekiel and Revelation. But we need to be studying to that point. And when someone comes up to us and says, well, how come your worship services are different than what I've seen before? How come y'all say it's wrong to do this or, or, or you must do it this way? Don't ever say, don't ever, ever say, well, that's just what our church does. Don't ever say, well, it's against my religion. Don't ever say, well, that's just not the way we do things. Give a Bible answer. Sit down and say, I'll, I'll be, I'd love to answer your question. But we need to sit down and I can open my Bible and show you book, chapter, and verse the answers to your question. And brethren, we can only be to this point. We can only get there if we study the Word of God. Now, part of the spiritual benefit of studying the Word of God and being able to rightly handle the Word of Truth is that it does prepare us for those individuals that would teach something contrary to the Word of God. For every Christian out there that teaches the truth, there are probably a thousand people that teach error, if not more. People look at the Word of God and they look at it as something that is subject to their own interpretation, own explanation. And they don't look for the understanding intended by God, but the way that it fit within their lives. And so as a result, we face individuals like this. And we have to be prepared. Jesus tells us that there are some people who are going to add to the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, and we, use, we reference this passage during our morning Bible study out here in the adult class when we were looking through Mark. But over here in Matthew chapter 15, there in verse 9, Jesus reminds these Pharisees here, charges these hypocrites that Isaiah prophesied about them, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but the heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. The Pharisees were teaching as doctrine the traditions of their fathers and binding it upon them. As we saw in Mark chapter 7 and, and the way that they viewed the washing of the hands and how it had to be done. They bound upon people the traditions that their fathers had come up with. Well, people do the same thing today. They'll talk about the Bible and they'll make rules that they say God wants us to do or they'll try to bind this or that. And you say, well, where in the Bible does it say it? Well, it's just not there, but I just know God wants us to do it that way. How? Well, because someone smarter than me said we needed to do it. It's not sufficient. They taught for doctrine the commandments of men. And as a result, he says, in vain they do worship me. Some individuals may not necessarily add to the word, but they will attempt to change it. They will attempt to pervert it. This is what Paul was dealing with in his letter to the churches throughout Galatia, the Judaizing teachers. They were coming in, and notice what he says in verse 6 of Galatians 1. He says, I marvel that you, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. He says, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you've received, let him be accursed. If it's not in here, then we don't abide by it. And if it is somehow or another twisted, we don't abide by it. And he marveled that they were so soon being led astray by those who would pervert, those who would twist the gospel of Christ. Notice over in the second chapter of Galatians, verse 4. Galatians chapter 2, verse 4, he goes on to say here within this text, And this occurred because of false brethren, secretly brought in, who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. People came in with the intent of leading the brethren astray, of turning them back to the Mosaical law, of binding upon them things that had been nailed to the cross. Now in chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? 
Who's bewitched you? Who has turned you away from the gospel that you have received? And then, as some people will pervert, Peter tells us that there are those who twist the scriptures. Notice with me in 2 Peter. I've got 1 Peter 3, verse 16. It's supposed to be 2 Peter. Chapter 3, verse 16. <clears throat> Observe here that the Apostle Peter says, As also in all his epistles, talking about the Apostle Paul now in his epistles, speaking in them of these things, on which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures. Have you ever had someone to twist your words? Okay. Have you ever said something and in your mind it was very plain and very simple and, and, and only meant this and someone says, oh, so you're saying such and such. You say, no, you're twisting my words. I never said that. Yeah, you did. They take your words and you twist your words. Well, the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter said that there are some that not only twist the words of Paul, but the rest of the Scriptures to mean what they want the Scriptures to say, to teach what they want the Scriptures to to teach. And brethren, Bible study, a benefit, or spiritual, spiritual, a, benef a spiritual benefit of Bible study is that we will be prepared for these times and can properly teach the truth of, what, of God's Word. And then the second spiritual benefit of our studying the Bible is very simple. It is spiritual growth. We will grow as a Christian. You know, when you look at us physically, we understand that it is important to watch a child grow because if a child doesn't grow physically, then there might be some physiological issues there that need to be addressed. But our lives as Christians, other than our outward obedience unto God, there's not much way of being able to tell by looking from the outside how much a person has or has not grown. But we ourselves know and it is important that we grow. Notice here a couple passages, beginning in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. When you study the Word of God, you grow in faith. We understand Romans chapter 10, verse 17. It's a very, very short verse here, explaining why the apostles were sent throughout the regions teaching the Word of God. He says, so then faith comes by hearing. This faith, this persuasion, this per conviction comes by hearing the Word of God. The more that we hear the Word of God, the stronger our conviction becomes, the stronger our faith becomes. Turn with me to Luke chapter 8 for just a moment. Over in the book of Luke, there in verse 8, I want you to notice here. Let's start our reading in verse 12. We'll read down through verse 15 what Jesus says. In Luke chapter 8, beginning there in verse 12, he says, those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Now observe this in this parable, in the explanation of the parables of the sower. Verse 12 says, those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Okay? Verse 13, by the, um, but the ones on the rock are the ones when they hear. Verse 14, now the ones that fall among thorns are those who, when they have heard. And then verse 15, but the ones that fell on the good ground are those who Having heard the word. Now you notice something in common with each of these instances? They all heard the word. Okay? They all heard. Unfortunately, the first one, the seed was snatched away. They didn't give it a chance to germinate. The second one, the seed was able to germinate, but because of the, the stony ground, he says there in verse 13, that when they, 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 they sprouted up, but he says in verse 13, and these have no root and believe for a while in time of temptation they fall away. The other one, there was germination there and, 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 and a root system was established, but because of the thorns that were choked out. And so these, he said, after having heard, they are choked with cares and riches and pleasures in life and bring no fruit to maturity. Then finally in verse 15, those who hear the word, they accept the word, they keep the word, and they bear fruit with patience. But in each of these things, you see a hearing of the Word of God. Now, once you become a Christian, once you are convicted by His Word and you say, I'm going to obey, you have to continue studying. Faith does not come one time by hearing the Word of God. It continually comes. It continually grows as we study His wonderful Word. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 28, notice with me there in verse 27. In Acts chapter 28, there in verse 27, 
He says in referencing the, the same prophet of Isaiah that we're talking about in our, our Mark study. He says, the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, Acts 8, 27. Notice that, their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with the hearts in turn, so that I should heal them. When we study the Word of God, we grow. We grow spiritually. We become stronger. We become more faithful unto God. And then Paul says, I'm talking about growth and maturity in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. He says that all scriptures have been given to us by God. Literally, God breathed. And they are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. That means mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The more you study, the more you grow. The less you study, the less you grow. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. He says, add to your faith virtue and to your virtue knowledge. We add all this to our lives as Christians so that we will be fruitful, so we will not be barren, so that we will be mature. And that's the point of Hebrews chapter 5. A time had come when the recipients there, had, they should have been able to have taught the Word of God. But instead, they needed someone to come and teach them again the first principles of righteousness. He says a babe is unskilled and cannot handle the meat of the word, but it's the mature who can handle it, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. So, brethren, that's for us. We grow spiritually. We grow in maturity. We grow in faith. We grow in the ability to rightly handle the word of truth, and that's why we study the word of God. But as we mentioned at the start of the lesson, we can control our studies by desiring to know more of God's Word. We can control our studies by giving attention to the study of the Word of God. And we should control our Bible studies because it will enable us. It will enable us to grow, to receive the spiritual benefits, and to have that level of maturity that we must have as children of God. Now, the question for you and I today is quite simple. Will we exercise? Will we exercise our responsibility to study the Word of God? You know, it's good that you come to services on Sunday morning. It's good that you come to Bible class. It's good that you come to the Sunday afternoon services at 5 o'clock, which we have every Sunday. It's good to be here Wednesday nights at 730 It's good to tune into the Scripture Way broadcast if you're able to on Tuesday nights at 730 it's good to attend any opportunity that you can have to study the Word of God. But if you're not studying daily at home, then truly where are the benefits? Make the time. We make the time for anything else in our lives that we want. Maybe some things we really don't want, but we have to make time for. Let's make time to study the Word of God today. If you are, are not a Christian, we can show you why you should become a child of God. We can talk to you about sin. We can talk to you about the death of Christ upon the cross of Calvary. We can talk about God's plan for you and what you must do to be saved. But ultimately, you are the one that should consider it and give thought to it and then be convicted by His Word to obey. And you'll have that opportunity here in just a second. If you believe that Christ is the Son of God, then let's repent of your sins. Let's turn away from that sinful life and obey His command to be baptized. And according to Mark 16, 16, you will be saved. If you are a Christian, have you been living your life? Have you been missing the mark? Have you been doing things you shouldn't do? Have you kind of lost the faith that you once had? Then I would suggest the problem may be a lack of Bible study in your life. And if so, let's come back today. Ask God to forgive you and resume with the dutiful study of His Word. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward now as we stand and as we sing. If the name of